My name is Megan Shirley and I work for the Forestry Commission as an incentives manager. Um, I'm part of the team who will be administering the seed sourcing grant. Um, I also work on the Tree Production Capital Grant, um, Tree Production and Innovation Fund and Woods into Management for Forestry Innovation Funds, uh, which some of you may already be aware of. Um, I'm joined today by Claire Trevedi, who's the Tree Health Scientific Advisor at DEFRA and who has been developing this grant along with her colleague uh, Maddie Dixon, who's a policy officer at DEFRA, um, and she's going to be helping with some of the questions at the end. Um, so I just wanted to start um, with a few bits of housekeeping. Um, Firstly, I just wanted to let you all know that we're going to be recording today's session um, and sharing it on the Seed Sourcing Grant webpage. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, please just make sure that you keep your camera off. Um, secondly, there's a lot of you on this call, um, so we just ask that you make sure that you're on mute throughout. Um, and finally, we're going to have time at the end of the call to answer questions. Um, we'll be taking questions from the chat, so um, please just add those as we go. And my colleague Noemi will be keeping an eye on those for us. Um, we've got a lot to get through today, so please just keep any questions you have specific to the grant. That would be really helpful. Um, so. I wanted to give you an overview of um, the session that we'll be doing today. Um, so Claire is going to be starting off uh, by giving some background to the grant and talking a bit about the scope of the funding. Um, I'll then go into a bit more of the detail and run through some eligibility criteria. And I'll then talk you through how to apply kind of step by step um, and what we're looking for from your application. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some time for questions, um, as I said before. Um, so Claire, I think unless I've missed anything, I'll hand over to you if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Megan. So as Megan says, I'm just going to start off by giving the background and the overview of, of the grant and its ob objectives and how it's been designed. Um, I expect you're all very familiar with the background context to this grant. So as you must surely all know, um, government has committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and new, new woodland creation and tree planting are expected to contribute significantly to um, meeting those objectives. And then the England Trees Action Plan outlines government's long-term vision for forestry, um, which seeks to deliver multiple benefits for the climate, but also for nature, the economy, um, and for people. And the England Tree Action Plan also outlines the need to plant diverse and well-managed woodlands in order to develop resilience um, for future stresses such as climate change and pests and diseases. So in that context, clearly a secure supply of diverse seed uh, is required to underpin our tree planting ambitions. We know that seed um, is in short supply on the global market, and so it makes sense for us to secure our own production and to ensure that we've got enough seed to meet um, our needs. And this, of course, also brings the added benefit of reducing those biosecurity risks that are associated with importing um, seeds and, uh, and saplings. So if you could change the slide, please, Megan. So in, in that context, and as part of a suite of wider activities that some of you will probably have heard me talk about on other occasions, um, we've launched the, the seed sourcing grant. This grant is really focused on the need to manage and to support seed production in England via registered seed stands and orchards. So it's a new grant, um, it's a competitive grant, um, 
meaning when you you know there's a limited pot of money and um, proposals will be judged uh, against evaluation to see which offers the best value for money um, and it will be administered by the Forestry Commission. It will support projects to increase not just the quantity but also the quality and diversity of seed stands and seed orchards that are on the register of basic material. Um, and as Megan said, it's complementary to the Tree Production Innovation Fund and the Tree Production Capital Grant that have already been launched and are underway. If we can go to the next slide. So we've um, secured £1.2 million pounds, um, to be uh, used over the next three years. So projects do need to complete by March 25. Um, funding is available for any species that are included in the UK FRM scheme, that includes the voluntary scheme. But we have identified 23 um, priority species which will be funded at 100%, with all other projects for other species being funded at 50%, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, you can put in proposals that um, cover multiple years, so long as they finish uh, by March 25. Um, and you can apply for a maximum of £75,000 per financial year across multiple bids. Uh, the minimum total cost is 10 k to be eligible for funding. OK, so in terms of what activities can be funded, the grant is purposely being designed to cover quite a wide range of activities that support seed production. Um, and we've grouped these into four key areas. So the first is um, management of existing seed stands to ensure that they're productive for seed collection. The second is identification of new stands that can be brought into use. The third is planning and planting of new seed stands and the fourth is planning and planting of new seed orchards. So as I say, it's a competitive grant with tight bound activities um, and really the aim is to kickstart activities in these areas. So you can develop proposals that cut across the four. You don't have to stick rigidly to the, to the boundaries between those um, areas. So long as the project forms a, a coherent project that we can evaluate against the, uh, the evaluation criteria which we've published. Um, next slide, thank you. So the grant covers all categories of FRM except SI seed sources, um, but all sites that are supported by the grant must either already be registered on the FRM register of basic material or they need to be brought onto it as part of the grant um, project activities. And the reason for that is that bringing seed stands and orchards onto the register means that the location and the details are publicly available. It means the planting stock is traceable um, and of known genetic origin. And it also means that they can be inspected through the FRM process. OK, next slide, please, Megan. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have identified 23 priority species that we will fund at 100%. Um, and alongside that, we've published as part of the grant guidance document species strategies that provide recommended approaches to enhancing seed production for those 23 species. Um, so those strategies are really there. They're intended to help applicants to develop um, proposals, but they're not intended to be prescriptive. We, we do recognise that further and more detailed work is required. And so the really important thing is that you, you use those strategies to develop your ideas and that in your proposal, you really outline what your approach is um, and the rationale behind it. Um, Whilst we've uh, developed the strategies for those 23 species, as I say, we really do welcome proposals for all other species, so long as they are within the um, FRM scheme. And just to finish up, um, I'm sure you've all seen the published list of um, priority species, um, but just in case, I'm just sharing you again there. So those, these species have been selected on the basis of um, quite a detailed um, piece of work which has uh, reviewed the current entries on the register of basic materials and their use 
Um, then that we also um, did interviews with a large number of nurseries and seed suppliers and other stakeholders that enabled us to review existing and future predicted supply and demand for different kinds of seed. Um, and then we married that also with information around likely future planting priorities in England um, and then also looked at those species that are most likely to need financial support to incentivize um, act activities around their seed sourcing. Um, so, so essentially that's how we've come to this list. This is the list for this grant round. It could change um, in future, but, but that's, this is the list for now. And with that, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end, but I'll hand over to Megan to run through the application process. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Claire. That was really helpful. Um, so as Claire said, I'm now going to run through um, the eligibility criteria and the application process. Um, so first off, we have some broad criteria that your grant must meet in order to be eligible to apply. Um, as Claire's already touched on, um, your project proposal must um, cover any of the species on the UK FRM scheme, including those in the voluntary scheme. The seed stand or seed orchard must be in England. Um, the work to be funded must not have commenced, um, so you'll only be able to start carrying out any work um, if you're successful once you have a signed agreement with us, which we anticipate to be mid-December. And activities must be associated with one of the eligible FRM categories that Claire's already discussed. Um, this slide gives an overview of the eligible costs, uh, basically what the grant can be used to pay for. Um, the list isn't exhaustive, but it covers most of the kinds of items that we'd expect to be offering funding for. Um, so it covers things like staff or contractor costs, seeds and saplings, consumables and temporary infrastructure for management. So that may include something like fencing, um, contributions towards equipment. Um, we've just noted here that if the equipment is over £500, then the level of contribution offered um, will be basically at the discretion of the evaluation panel. And then travel and subsistence uh, specifically related to the grant activity. Um, this next slide runs through the items that are ineligible for funding. Um, so I'll just quickly run through these. Um, so this includes ongoing maintenance of the seed stand or seed orchard after the project delivery window. Uh, so we're basically only funding time bound activities. Um, insurance for capital items or staff. Repairs and ongoing maintenance to equipment any travel and subsistence that's not directly related to the grant, costs or overheads like rent and utilities related to staff um, involved in the project, um, costs involved in preparing your application or working on any other grant scheme, um, costs incurred outside of the project delivery window, and then um, retrospective for funding for work that has already been started or carried out before the grant agreement. So moving on to who can apply, um, the grant is open to any UK based public, private or third sector organisation. Um, so it's quite broad, but we'll be looking for you to demonstrate how your organisation will use the grant to um, enhance the quality, quantity and diversity of English stands, um, seed stands and seed orchards. Um, we've listed here the kind of applica applicants that we would expect to apply. Um, but again, this isn't exhaustive. So if you're not on the list, um, that doesn't mean you're not eligible. Um, Forestry England and Forest Research are not eligible for funding under the, under the grant, uh, but they can be subcontracted. Um, also, we will accept joint applications, um, but you'll need to nominate a lead applicant. Um, so they'll be the person who's on the agreement with us and they'll receive the funding from us. Um, 
So if you're doing a joint application, just list any of the partners on the application form and explain how you'll be working together. So that covers the background to the grant and the eligibility criteria. Um, I'm now going to talk you through how to apply for the grant. Um, I'm going to take you through this step by step, so apologies if it's a bit dry, uh, but hopefully it'll make the process really clear for you. Um, this gives you an overview of the application process. Um, it's a single stage application process and we ask you to complete an application form and a finance spreadsheet. Um, all the forms and guidance can be found on the gov.uk website, which hopefully you've already seen. Um, all questions on the form are mandatory and they have word limits, so please fill in every section and don't exceed those limits. Um, and once you've completed your form, please return it to us with your spreadsheet to the SSG inbox. The email address is on the screen there. Um, and the deadline is five to midnight on Sunday, 13th of November. Um, and we're also available on that email address if you have any inquiries in the meantime. So the application itself is made up of 10 parts. Uh, sounds like quite a lot, but quite a few of those sections are just there for your information or declarations that you just need to read and make sure you understand and agree to. Um, Part one uh, starts by asking you for some personal details and some background to your project. So we will be looking for, um, for you to tell us the financial year or years in which you're applying for funding. Um, as Claire said, that can be up to March 2025. We want a short summary of your project. We'll ask you which species your project, um, your proposal relates to. And if you're applying to manage an existing seed stand or converting a seed source into a seed stand, we'd want you to give us the ID of that from the Register of Basic Materials. Following that, um, there's a list of eligibility criteria. Um, I've given you an example of what that looks like on the slide here. Um, read through each of these really carefully and confirm whether you fulfill them. Um, We'll do a check of this list uh, when we receive your applications. So just make sure that you um, have confirmed all of those. So part two of the application has nine questions um, and the panel will use these to score your application. Um, so this is basically the information that they'll use to assess your proposal. So please try to include as much information and detail as possible here, um, whilst also sticking within the word limit, um, which is 250 words for each question. Um, you'll notice that I've put in brackets the weighting of each question. Uh, so the first two questions are weighted at 20% and the following questions are each rated at 10%. So question one um, is asking about species seed strategies. Um, and what we want to know from you here is the extent to which your project will implement any of the 23 priority species strategies that Claire uh, ran through earlier. As Claire said, if you have a slightly alternative approach to increasing the supply of a priority species, what we want you to do here is to explain your rationale for that. Um, if your project is based around a non-priority species, um, please outline why the activity is important and how the activities will enhance the quality, quantity or diversity of English seed supply. And again, we just want to know your rationale for the approach here. Um, for projects relating to uh, planting seed stands and orchards, um, please explain your approach to selecting the origin and genetic diversity of the basic materials. And we'd also like you to tell us how your proposed activities will increase domestic treescape resilience to climate disease or pests. Question two is about how your project increases um, the sector's capacity, and it's also weighted at 20%. Um, 
here we'd like you to explain the impact that your activity will have on seed pre-production and planting across England. We'd like you to outline the intended outcome of the proposed activities. So, for example, if um, what kind of registered seed stand or orchard will your pro project result in? Um, and we want things, uh, details of things like location, estimated size, estimated number of trees, that kind of thing. Um, and we also want to know how and when the proposed activities will benefit the market. Um, so when will the seed stand or orchard become productive for seed collections? Um, and how will you ensure seed is collected and brought to market? Question three is about longevity of your project. Um, and specifically, we want to know how your activity will enable seed collections into the future. Um, so if, for example, you're proposing to manage a seed stand, uh, we want you to tell us how you would ensure that the stand would be productive beyond um, the end of the funding period. Um, question four asks about team, um, about your team's resources and track record. Um, so we're looking for you to outline the roles, skills and experience of the people involved in your project. Um, and that includes both your organisation and partners your track record in delivering similar projects, any resources, equipment or facilities you need to deliver the project and how you'll access those. Um, and then tell us about any third parties, including subcontractors who you'll need to involve in the project. Question five um, is about deliverability. Um, so tell us here how you're planning to manage the project. Um, we also want to know about any um, major milestones and your proposed timescales for the project. Um, if it's easier to attach a Gantt chart or another document here explaining um, that, then please do and just refer to that in your response to the question. Um, and yeah, we want to know about your approach to project management, um, including any tools or mechanisms you'll use. Question six asks about um, the risks of your project. Um, so please identify the main risks involved in your project um, and explain how these will be mitigated um, and highlight which of those are most significant. Um, again, if you want to include a separate risk register, um, please do so and just let us know in your response that you've done that. And then question seven covers additionality. Um, by this, we just mean how will public funds make a difference to your project? Um, so we want you to tell us if the project would go ahead without public funding. If not, then why? And if it would, then tell us the difference that public funding would make. Um, so basically, what would it allow you to do that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise? You'll be pleased to know that this is the last of the assessment questions. Um, and this one is about costs and value for money. Um, we want you to tell us here how much your project will cost and how it represents value for money for the Forestry Commission and the taxpayer. Um, you'll need to justify how the costs you're proposing will help you to reach your project goals um, and why they represent best value for money. So you could do things like explain other alternatives that you've explored, that kind of thing. If you have any subcontractor costs, please justify these and explain why they're critical to the project. Um, and if you're applying for a non-priority species, so where only 50% funding is available, please tell us here where your match funding will be coming from. Um, the evaluation panel will also use your finance spreadsheet when reviewing your response to this question, and we'll come on to that shortly. So those eight assessment questions uh, will be scored by our evaluation panel. 
As I mentioned before, the first two are double weighted, so worth 20% each, and the rest are worth 10% each. Um, the panel will score each question out of four um, using the following criteria, which I've put on the slide. Um, so this ranges from zero, which is unacceptable, to four, which is excellent. Um, any application that scores zero for any question will be rejected. And a proposal must score a minimum of 20 out of 40 to be eligible for funding. Um, so basically, you need to average twos across the board to be eligible for funding. Um, I mentioned earlier that you need to submit both an application form and a finance spreadsheet. Um, these can both be found on the Seed Sourcing Grant gov.uk page. Um, for the finance spreadsheet, we're looking for you to give us a detailed breakdown of costs uh, for each of the financial years in which you're applying for funding. Um, we've got a couple of bits of advice for you here. So firstly, um, please seek quotes before you're applying so you're confident in the costs that you're requesting. Um, if your numbers look suspiciously round, then the panel may query those. Um, and we also just want to make sure that your, the funding you're applying for will cover the actual costs that you're going to incur because we can't increase um, your total funding at a later date. Um, secondly, please think really carefully about the financial years in which you're applying for funding. Um, we can't move funding between financial years. Um, so any activity you apply for in a particular financial year will need to be complete and invoiced by 27th of March of that financial year. Um, we're obviously part way through this financial year and we're hoping to issue most agreements by mid-December. So if you apply for funding in 22-23, you'll have between roughly mid-December and 27th of March. So that's about three and a half months to complete those activities. Um, so just think really carefully about what you can realistically deliver in that time. Having said that, because we've got so little time left of this financial year, um, it's likely that the competition for funding in this year will be lower. Um, so if you can complete the work in this financial year, it may be a good idea to apply in this financial year. Um, so this just shows you what the uh, finances spreadsheet looks like. Um, I hope it's relatively self-explanatory, um, but I'll just quickly go through it. So we ask for each item, and that could also include things like staffing costs. We ask for the financial year in which you're claiming for that item. Uh, the activity it relates to, so those are the eligible activities that Claire ran through earlier. So in this case, it's um, planting a new seed stand. The species it relates to, whether that's a priority species, and then the total cost and the amount that you're applying for. Um, this last column will um, automatically calculate. So if you're applying for a priority species, this can be up to 100%. And if it's non-priority, uh, this should be up to 50%. Over to the right is a little summary, um, which will just show the total costs you're applying for. Uh, please just check this before uh, submitting your application. Check it looks right. Um, and just to mention here, um, about VAT. So if you are VAT registered, you can only claim for costs exclusive of VAT. If you're not VAT registered, uh, you'll be able to claim for costs inclusive of VAT. Uh, so please just reflect that in the prices that you quote on here. So going back to the main form, part four just asks you to outline your proposed activities, outputs and outcomes. Um, this will basically form the basis of your agreement with us if you're successful. Um, the funded activities is really self-explanatory, but we're wanting you to break those down by financial year here. For the outputs, 
we want you to um, let us know what outputs you expect to achieve and when. Uh, so basically what will result from the funded activities. Um, and we want you to quantify these if at all possible. So you could tell us things like um, the number and species of trees planted, um, the area of stand brought into management, or that that stand will be added to the register of basic materials. So anything quantifiable that you can include there um, is brilliant. And finally, for the outcomes, we want to understand what you expect to happen longer term beyond the period of the grant. Again, please try to quantify this. So if you're planting a new stand or orchard, you could tell us the number of years you estimate it will take until the stand or orchard is productive. Um, just give your best guesses here because we know that a lot of factors will be at play. Um, and some of this section may repeat what you've put elsewhere on the form, but that's absolutely fine. And then the final sections of the form are largely there for your information. So please read those carefully. Um, in part eight, there are some check boxes. Um, so please read each of those and tick that you um, are happy with each of them. And then finally, in part 10, we ask you to sign your form. Um, you can either do this as a digital signature. So if you open your the form in Adobe or I think other PDF software as well, you should be able to add a digital signature or you can print it off, sign it and scan it back in. We can't accept just a typed signature. It needs to be a proper digital signature. Um, and then you submit the form by emailing it to us at the SSG inbox. Um, when you do this, if there's anything commercially sensitive in your application, please just notify us at that point so we're aware. So this just covers the next steps um, once you've submitted your application. So the deadline is on 13th of November at five to midnight. The panel will be meeting to uh, do a final review of applications at the end of November and we'll be agreeing outcomes at that point. We then hope to issue outcome letters and grant agreements in early to mid-December. Um, and then if you're successful, as soon as you have a signed agreement, you can start 2022-23 work. So this is the last slide, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, I just wanted to explain how the reporting and claims process works if you are successful with the grant. We'll ask you for a final report at the end of the project and for any multi-year projects, we'll also ask for a progress report at the end of each financial year. In each financial year, you'll be able to claim at the end of the year and on one other date of your choosing. And when you claim, we'll ask you to submit evidence of your expenditure. So that's usually invoices or timesheets. Um, and if your claim isn't accompanied by a final or annual report, we'll also ask for a short progress update. Um, once we have your claim forms and are happy with those, we'll make payment by BAX transfer. And just to reiterate, the final deadline for reports and claims in 22-23 is 27th of March 2023. So that is the end of our slides. Um, I hope that's been useful for you. Um, I think Noemi has kindly been keeping an eye on the chat for any questions. And as I said before, we've got Maddie Dixon from DEFRA and Claire, who you heard from earlier, uh, ready to help with questions as well. Um, so I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, and yeah, Noemi, are you happy to fire away with some questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so for some reason, my camera Oh no, okay, it's working now. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and um, thank you for, um, thank you to Amanda for answering a few of them. Um, apologies for any background noise. Um, uh, someone's asking why we are only supporting native broadleaves. 
Okay, so so I'm happy to take that. They're not quite all native broadleaves. There is one non-native. Um, if, if you, I'll let you spot that in the list. Um, but it's essentially for the reasons that I outlined when I was speaking. So we took into account um, likely future planting patterns in England, and we expect to continue to see um, broadleaf woodlands um, providing the majority of planting in England. Um, we looked at supply and demand as it currently stands and where there's current um, problems with supply. So the, the more minor species tend to be where it's um, sometimes harder to get um, seed. Um, and we also looked at the current incentives for planting and obviously the more commercial species, which tend to be the conifers, there's um, greater commercial incentives because obviously there, there's a greater um, market for that material at the moment um, in, in terms of timber and wood products. So, so that's how we came to that list. Um, and as I said, previously, that doesn't mean that it won't change in the future, but that's, that's uh, the, you know, where, where we've come to in terms of identifying priorities at this moment in time. Thank you, Claire. Um, the next question um, asks, are there any schemes that cover Wales? So we um, have worked closely with um, the devolved administrations. They're, they're well aware of this scheme. Um, they're very supportive of it. And what I would say is that they're watching to see how it works. So um, the short answer is no, there isn't an exactly analogous scheme right now, either in Scotland or Wales. But if you know you have projects that you would like to do in Scotland or Wales, I think it's worth letting us know and letting the Scottish and Wales gov government know because you know it's definitely an area of interest to them. Thank you, Claire. That's great. Um, and someone else is also asking if you are selecting plush trees for orchard creation, will the grant cover selection of trees in Scotland and Wales if the orchard will be in England? Yeah, so I saw that one um, from Joe. I think yeah. that one, um, I think what we would be looking for in that scenario um, is, is the clear rationale how the sampling strategy had been put together and why, so that the seed orchard, which is in England, would clearly support planting needs in England. Um, so obviously there we'd be looking to understand if material, particularly of you know northern Scottish origin, is, is that going to be suitable in the mix coming out of the orchard for England? And, and I'm not saying it wouldn't be, but that's the kind of rationale that we'd be looking for. But yeah, otherwise uh, it's eligible, so long as the orchard itself is in England. Lovely. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I think you mentioned this earlier, Megan, but will the slide deck be available on the website as well, as well as the recording? The PowerPoint slide deck. Um, I'm not actually quite sure on that, but we can probably follow up with the slide deck um, to everyone who registered through Eventbrite. We'd probably do it that way, so um, we can definitely look at doing that. Fab, thank you. Uh, and someone else is asking, um, are we likely to reopen SSG in the future or is this just going to be a one off um, application? Shall I take that, Megan, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, happy to take that. Uh, so it, it depends on um, how this round goes, essentially. Um, it is quite a limited pot of money at the minute. Um, and if it all gets allocated in this round, we may not be able to do another. Um, if we're undersubscribed, then we would, I imagine, look to do another call um, fairly soon, having having looked at the reasons why we were undersubscribed. Fantastic, thank you. Um, someone else is asking, are existing stands not supported if they are already registered or if they are supported if they are not registered? I think that's what Yeah, the I, I think that question, let me try and answer it. Um, so existing stands that are already on the register, you they, they would be eligible for the management activities. So if you've got a stand which is already registered but is maybe not as productive or not as well used as it might be, then that would be the perfect case um, 
you know, for applying for the management activities where you could take, you know, do things that would tweak the, um, the stand and, and how it's managed in order to overcome those challenges. Um, so that would be eligible. I hope that answers that question. If not, drop us an email through the through the SSG grant email address. Lovely. Thank you, Claire. Um, the next question is asking, would singular trees within one land holding as listed as a group be acceptable? Yes, I think Amanda has answered that oh, one. Sorry, Sing I missed that. Yeah, singular trees wouldn't meet the criteria to be a seed yeah. stand. I don't know if Amanda wants to add to what she's already put in the chat. Sorry, no, yes, the singular <laughs> trees we just count, um, count as a seed source. We couldn't register them as a stand. Yeah, and the reason for that is we're looking for genetic diversity in exactly. our stands. So one tree just wouldn't That's be genetically provide. diverse and, and wouldn't be meeting the aims of the grant, even if it was allowed within the FRN um, scheme. Lovely, thank you, Claire. Um, is there a minimum size requirement or recommendation and or minimum number of saplings for new seed stands slash orchards? So again, I'll hand it over to Amanda in a minute. I mean, from my point of view, again, it's it's maximising the genetic diversity in the stand. Um, and so if you look at the species strategies, there is guidance in there on the um, minimum number of individuals to be sampling from or to be planting to create the stand or register the stand. But again, I'll just hand over to Amanda who can give us what's actually um, required by the scheme. So I've already put in the chat about stands. We'd be looking for a minimum of 30 plus trees um, and we're really looking for, this is to ensure, as you say, genetic diversity, interpollination and to avoid unfavourable effects of inbreeding. Um, in terms of seed orchards, um, yeah, again, um, we would, any seed orchard application, we have um, guidelines available on our website on how um, what what we're looking for. Um, we can certainly put a link in this chat for for that um, so that people can can go in and have a look themselves to see um, species. It will be dependent on species in terms of seed orchards as well. We're looking for isolation and, and things like that. So um, certainly if there's any questions about um, thinking of what, what people are thinking of planting or they're, they're interested in, in, in registering, they can send them to us and we can certainly discuss them. Lovely, thank you Amanda. Um, same person as, is asking, can more than one location be included in one application or would separate applications be required for different locations, even if owned and managed by the same organisation? Yeah, no, they could all be in one application. And I think if if they're all covering the same species, I would certainly really encourage them to be because that's essentially one project that we would want to be looking at as as, as a single entity. Um, if you're looking at multiple species across multiple locations, I think just I think that's your decision on how you want to chunk that out and, and submit it, um, you know, taking a view on how you know, the, the evaluation criteria that Megan just ran through. Lovely, thank you. Um, and if the applicant is VAT registered, but they're unable to claim VAT back, can they include an irrecoverable VAT in their costings? Um, this may be a finance question that we might have to take away if we can answer it. Um, yeah, that sounds quite specific. I think if you could email that to the SSG inbox then we can have a look at that and and see if we can kind of deal with that on a on an individual case basis I think yeah unless think you know the best. answer to that Noemi no I don't think so that that's okay. a little bit a little bit more complex might require some more thought um but uh yeah next question would temporary removable electric deer fencing be eligible rather than permanent I think that's fine yeah I think so I mean we would just be wanting to understand with with any measure fencing or otherwise why you know what is the purpose of doing it and and how does it enhance the stand yeah absolutely um and someone is asking is fencing necessary at all if the owner expects collectors to climb 
No, I mean, we're not, this is definitely not a fencing grant. <laughs> if fencing is helpful, as we've just said, explain how and why. And if it's yeah. not, don't claim for it. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, Claire. Um, someone's asking, why do you need a registered stand for elder? Surely they can be picked everywhere. So, so that would be for the reasons that I outlined. We, we are definitely not saying that um, SI seed sources are unimportant. They're, they're great and they um, do a great job and we happy to see that continue. But in terms of spending government money, we need to um, be putting that in stands that are on the register so that they're publicly visible to everyone. We can inspect them um, and um, and we know that they meet the, the criteria for the FRM scheme. So, uh, yeah, SI source is great, but just don't fall within the um, scope of the grant. Yeah, fantastic. Um, if you plant a seed orchard, can you also apply for woodland creation? I assume this is for the same piece of land. Um, yeah, and Megan, did you want to take that one? Or I mean, I was going to say that the activities that you're asking for funding for would have to be completely mutually exclusive. Um, so I think if it's for the same area of land, then I would say no to that. Claire, would you agree on that? Um, I think I'm not quite sure to be honest. <laughs> we we would need to. I think because the, the this grant covers very specific activities, you probably would. You know, we did look at whether seed sourcing activities could be part of UCO, and it wasn't really quite possible at this moment in time. Though in the future, seed sourcing might be part of um, woodland creation grants. Um, and so I think you would need to apply for through this grant if you wanted to do seed sourcing activities. I don't know that that excludes you from applying to other grants for the same piece of land. I don't think that's necessarily a problem, um, but it might be on a case by case basis. We have to make a judgment on that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe just include that in your application form yeah. if that's something that you yeah. want to do. Yeah. yeah, you would definitely need to um, to yeah make that very clear because we wouldn't be able to double fund, obviously, for the same activities. Yeah. That's the biggest problem. Absolutely. Um, Joe's asking, would the grant support sourcing material from the near continent if suitable matched to UK future climate scenarios? Yes, I've answered that question for Joe before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is possible, so long as the orchard is in England. Yeah, lovely. Uh, a couple of questions left. Um, any problem in sourcing seed from ancient semi-natural woods and or notable or veteran trees to create a seed orchard? Um, no, so long as you're meeting all the, um, you know, permissions and you're meeting you know you're not um you need to check all the natural england regulations and so on um that it is quite complex if if you're taking seed for commercial benefit um there is some restrictions around that so you just need to check that out uh but otherwise it's it's fine in fact, we would encourage it because ancient semi-natural woodlands mean that it's more likely to be um, indigenous material of, you know, it's known UK origin. Um, so, so that's to be encouraged in that sense. Lovely. Um, the final question that has come through, um, someone's saying that they have about 40 junipers planted in four separate locations across an 11 hectare wood in Croydon. Um, they would like to collect about 1.5 litres of berries recently for the Downlands partnership to propagate from. Could they register as a seed site source for future users? Um, it sounds, well, they're across four locations. Possibly. Um, uh, Amanda might have a view on whether, because they're across four locations, 40 trees, that might not quite meet the uh, the number requirements. 
I'd love to see it because I live in Croydon. So please, can I come and have a look? <laughs> Amanda, do you, um, can you answer that one? Is Amanda still on the call? Oh, she might have left. Okay, if, if she's gone. Um, I think, Anthony, have a look at the um, FRM registration guidelines. I think you might just be on the boundary of what isn't isn't acceptable. So I would have a look at the guidelines and maybe drop us that question again through the email and we can work with the FRM team to answer that one. Lovely. Um, that's the end of the written questions. Um, <laughs> um, Thank you. Someone's got, their, uh, someone's got their hand up. Um, so would you like to come off mute, please? Nick, have you got your hand up? Maybe an accidental hand. <laughs> Probably an accident. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. No problem. Um, so are I there just any more? If I could, could, I, could I just ask, you know, why don't you see English Open on the list, please? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Why don't we? Why don't we have English Oak on the list? Okay, um, so English Oak isn't on the list for a few reasons. Um, it's partly because uh, there are actually quite a few registered stands and orchards already, and we know that there are more online. We're already funding work on oak orchards. And it's also because um, we took a view that oak uh, is in high enough demand that there's likely to be significant commercial benefit from um, oak stands and orchards and therefore slightly less need to 100% fund work on oak. Oak projects would be very welcome, very welcome indeed, but they will only be funded at 50% for those reasons. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Joe has her hand up as well. Yes, um, I just thought it was easier to ask than to type it in. <laughs> I, I, I've not read all your strategies yet in depth, but I was looking at the beach strategy and it identifies 120 plus trees in grafting. Now, I don't know how readily beach, for example, grafts or if anybody on the call knows, but if one put a proposal together for this work and aimed to try and grafting, I'm just wondering about you know, the success rates and how that might impact on grant delivery if we graft lots of trees, but then they don't take. Mm. I, it, it's a tricky one to know how to to address that. If, if you've got any comments, please. No, I don't do um, myself because I, as I say, though, you know, the, the strategies were developed by a, a, a technical group, but we do recognise that we haven't had enough time to really, you know, develop them as much as, as we would like. Um, so I think if, if you can sort of see problems with them, then as we said, outline your rationale and why you think that that is the, the most appropriate way forward. And, and you definitely wouldn't be penalised for that. Uh. Thanks. Lovely. Um, well, there are no more questions, so I'll pass um, pass it back to Megan to just close the meeting. Great. Thanks so much, Noemi. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today and for all of your questions. Um, I really hope that's been helpful for you. Um, if there's anything um, that we haven't got to or anything you just think about after the call, please just email us at the SSG inbox um, and Noemi or I will get back to you. Um, our team are at meetings for the next couple of days so if we don't reply to you immediately then we're not ignoring you. Um, I believe we're also going to follow up with the link to the recording and I'll look into whether we can also share the slides with you as well um, so you can watch back anything if you joined a bit late and missed anything. Um, and I think if that covers everything. Uh, sorry, um, Megan. Um, we had one more question come through. Just someone asking where the species strategies are stored. Ah, uh, yeah, I can just cover that quickly. So they're on the gov.uk page. So if you go to the page about the seed sourcing grant, 
there should be a link to those seed strategies on that page. And um, maybe we can include the link to that when we share um, the follow up from the webinar as well. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, everyone.